Welcome to my channel, INTJ Island. Today, I'm going to take a look at the novel 1984 by George Orwell. The book was published in 1949, two years before I was born. But by using a metaphorical story, this tome is still more accurately descriptive of the world today than most books written by self-proclaimed awakened people. Because the young people today have grown up in a world presented to them by our own Ministry of Truth. Our ministry is not contained in a building, but rather in the strings of power moving the puppet institutions that we erroneously view as being independent. The methods are different, but the effect is the same. I judge things by their results, not by the stated ideals or goals of whatever acting agent is being evaluated. For me, if an action or philosophy produces bad results, no amount of virtue signaling or proclamations of high ideals can justify it. The 1984 story begins by describing the life of a 39-year-old man named Winston Smith. Due to poor nutrition and a lack of good hygiene opportunities, Smith has physical ailments that today we would expect only in the very old. Doctors didn't appear in the story, with the implication that they were part of the nationalized system that made everything scarce. Winston lived in a geographical location called Airstrip 1, that sat on the land that had once been occupied by Britain. The world was split into three major superpowers. Airstrip 1, along with North and South America, Australia, South Africa, and various Atlantic islands, were inside the superpower ruled over by Big Brother, and it was called Oceania. We get a glimpse into the operation of Oceania, but it is only indirectly that we see what the other superpowers are like. It is implied that the people living in those other areas are as downtrodden as are the unfortunate people under Big Brother. We see some of their captured soldiers being herded through town to be ridiculed by the masses, but little else is told about them. Moving east from Airstrip 1, there was the second superpower named Eurasia, which included all the areas once held by the Soviet Union, including Eastern Europe and Russia. Next was the last superpower, covering the land that today is occupied by China and all of Eastern Asia, including India. Focusing down on Oceania, something that might sound familiar to you, this superpower was always at war. When the novel started, Oceania was at war with Eurasia, and it was allied with East Asia. But partway into the story, that situation was changed, and East Asia became the enemy, and Eurasia was Big Brother's ally. An interesting point about this change is that the Ministry of Truth did a complete rewrite of history to show that Oceania had never been at war with Eurasia, but had always been allied with that power. And Big Brother had always been at war with East Asia and had never been allied with it. This change happened overnight and the people of Oceania, completely connected to the propaganda feed from their media machine of the Ministry of Truth, didn't even blink as they accepted the phony propaganda as being real. In the end, it didn't matter at all which superpower was their enemy. The important thing was that war must be in the air constantly to justify limiting supplies and the expectations of the population. As Orwell wrote, and I quote, The consciousness of being at war, and therefore in danger, makes the handing over of all power to a small caste seem the natural, unavoidable condition of survival. End quote. Does this idea seem familiar to you? It certainly does to me. The government control over the people was broken up into departments, each handling a portion of the enforcement. The Ministry of Truth was where Winston Smith worked. The name, as with all the ministry departments, was absurd. The Ministry of Truth only spewed out lies while avoiding the truth. It was the propaganda center that is the equivalent of what we would call the media today. It handled all video news, usually filled with content that was made from whole cloth, with little connection to reality, and dedicated to propaganda, also completely fictitious. But it was intended to keep everyone thinking like good, politically correct clones. Everything was produced to keep people walking the party path, loving Big Brother with no room for dissent. Textbooks from this ministry were, of course, used to program the children to love Big Brother and to look at their parents suspiciously as potential traitors. Winston's job consisted primarily of adjusting or replacing the truth to fully align with the party-approved lies, such as removing people who had formerly accomplished newsworthy achievements. 
but had now fallen into disfavor with Big Brother, and as a result, they were vaporized. To be vaporized meant that you were completely expunged from all written material and no one was allowed to mention your name again. People who had been vaporized had become what was called unpersons, and for all intents and purposes, they had never existed. One particular problem that Winston Smith was directed to solve was when a party leader named Comrade Withers had fallen into disfavor. He had become an unperson and was vaporized. However, in a Big Brother speech given a few months before, this now unperson had been mentioned favorably. This could not be allowed to stand, and so Winston Smith was tasked with changing the record for that speech. To do this, Winston created a completely fictitious person whom he named Comrade Oglevy, and he inserted this person who had never really existed into the record of the speech in place of the comments concerning Comrade Withers. Winston Smith was highly creative in using the style of delivery of other Big Brother speeches so that this new alteration fit perfectly into the speech. Now, Comrade Oglevy was a perfect party man. At age nine, he was already a leader in the spies, an organization for the children to train them to denounce to the party anyone who was unorthodox. Oglevy did his spies work well, and at the tender age of 11, he denounced his own uncle to the thought police. He was clearly opposed to sex, shown by his rising, at the age of 17, to the position of district organizer for the Junior Anti-Sex League. He didn't trust anyone. At age 19, he showed genius when he created a very effective weapon, which was quickly adopted by the military. Finally, he died gloriously at the age of 23, performing a courageous act in war. The man was flawless in the ways of the party. And in this dystopian world, the real man, Comrade Withers, was erased, and this paper man, Comrade Oglevy, who had never actually existed, became as real as any historic figure and would forever be found in the saga of the past, and there was no way to prove that he was not as real as Julius Caesar. Another example of the Ministry of Truth's work that is worthy of note was when an adjustment was made to the chocolate ration. As with all things under a complete socialist system, there are always shortages that leave the people in want. In Oceania, the amount of chocolate that each person was entitled to was lowered from 30 grams down to 20 grams. A mere 24 hours after that announcement was made, the Ministry of Truth reported that the chocolate ration had been raised up to 20 grams and that people were in the streets celebrating this increase and praising Big Brother for it. Winston watched other men at his table as this disingenuous announcement hit one of the ubiquitous video screens that was mounted on the wall and everyone else in the room was suddenly filled with joy about this utter lie that was being put out. Winston, who was going through his own awakening at the time, wondered how people's memories could be so short that even 24 hours was long enough to erase the facts from their minds. The news is today, and yesterday's news is forgotten, especially if it should show the absurdity of the current narrative. Catherine, Winston's ex-wife, was a party drone who would have almost certainly been cheering this lying report about chocolate and Winston felt that she had never had a thought in her head that was not a party slogan, and she would believe anything, however absurd, as long as the party put it out. They had parted ways 11 years before this story began. Apparently, she was good riddance to Winston, who seldom gave her any thought. While the term AI was not in the book, the concept was clearly there. The Ministry of Truth had machines that composed all the popular music for the masses, and also all entertainment reading, like novels. Everything that the public consumed for entertainment or education was produced by the Ministry of Truth. The party motto on history was, Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. By rewriting history, you can actually change history to be something that it had not been in reality. Suddenly, fiction is nonfiction and nonfiction becomes worse than fiction, for it had been erased entirely. A hero of the past can be vilified, or be erased entirely. A villain from the past, or even someone who never existed, but who was created in print, can become a hero and a role model for all to aspire to. There were other ministries, equally misnamed. 
The Ministry of Peace was the war machine, and it handled the perpetual orchestration of the war effort. The Ministry of Love, which we were exposed to in depth in the last section of the book, was where torture and re-education occurred, driving people mad with the desire to find peace in death. But that wish could only be granted once the mind gave up its free agency and came to love Big Brother unreservedly. The Ministry of Plenty was in charge of keeping food and production distribution low so that people constantly lived in a state of want and need, and therefore they had a total dependence upon the government for survival. This reminds me of the story of Oliver Twist, written by the genius Charles Dickens. Oliver had been apprenticed to an undertaker to learn the trade, and one day as he was performing his assigned duties, a much larger boy started ridiculing Oliver's dead mother with great insults. Oliver was infuriated and proceeded to give his antagonist a well-deserved shellacking. When the parish beetle had been summoned in order to control the enraged Oliver, that man told the undertaker's family that they were at fault because they had fed Oliver too much. At the workhouse where he had lived before, he had been starved with a barely subsistence level of gruel, but the undertaker had fed Oliver plenty of meat rather than gruel, and that diet had caused him to get roused up, and he therefore, according to the beetle, would not stay in his proper place. Rest assured, the Ministry of Plenty never made that mistake. The people in Winston's world had to recite the party slogans often to keep them fresh in their minds. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. These slogans made it quite clear that facts, logic, and reason were not required. In fact, they were violently discouraged. How can one condemn war if it is in fact peace? Why would you pursue freedom if it is in fact slavery? And acquiring knowledge is of no value. In fact, it is a handicap if ignorance is where true strength is to be found. This is a toxic mindset, but it was the party line. Of course, as you probably already know, it is easy to find similar absurdities around you today if you look for them. The largest group of people inside Oceania was the Proles, which is short for the proletariat. Winston Smith felt that if there were any hope of revolt to dethrone Big Brother, it would come from the Proles. They had the numbers to do it. I too had a similar view towards the end of last century as I struggled to understand the world around me. I thought if the people awoke to what had already happened and where our path was leading, they could arise and set things right. But George Orwell had been there before me, and he explained why it wouldn't work any more in America than it could in Oceania. In Part 1 of 1984 and in Chapter 7, Orwell wrote about the proles. The party claimed to have liberated the proles from bondage. Before the revolution, it was said, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. Meanwhile, the party taught the proles were natural inferiors, and with a few rules they could easily be kept in subjection, like animals. And I quote, So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves, like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire, they married at twenty, they were middle-aged at thirty, and they died, for the most part, at sixty. End quote. As long as they were focused on the mundane acts that filled up their days, they were no danger to anyone. They would act like herd animals that all moved, on the whole, in predictable ways. The mundane aspects of heavy labor, taking care of their children, and, I quote, petty quarrels with their neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous, end quote. All that the party required of them was what Orwell called a primitive patriotism which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. The term sheeple has become a common word today to describe the bulk of the citizenry, and that would also describe the proles. 
Something else he wrote struck me as particularly apropos to what I see around me today, and I quote, And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because, being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty, specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice, end quote. I have watched this for decades, as one outrage arises after another, and people get caught up in one of these for a time, and then, when that one is put into the past, another arises almost by magic. The focus is always on the outrage of today, while the old outrages are forgotten. Bit by bit, the continuous stream of outrages, one after another, moves the society in the desired direction, and the herd responds predictably. Sociologically, the place that we are currently occupying is vastly different than the place we occupied a few decades ago. Daily, the changes are small, but over time, they are cumulative, and they add up to great changes. But as Orwell pointed out, we don't notice that we are being controlled because our own discontent also can lead nowhere, because the herd is without general ideas and can only focus on petty, specific grievances. The big picture of how things have changed and the direction in which they are changing, unfortunately, escape their notice. This is in part because our own Ministry of Truth censors unorthodox ideas unmercifully, deleting, banning, and censoring views that stand against the party line. The First Amendment to the Constitution is a perpetual thorn in their sides that they look to undermine at every turn, using tactics like saying, You have freedom of speech, but some speech is forbidden. You can't have forbidden speech at the same time as having free speech. That is what Big Brother's new speak would call doublethink at work. The progression of Winston's own destruction is predictable, even to himself. He buys a blank book where he can write down his own thoughts. This was a guaranteed path to death, and he knew it. The purchase of the book alone was a crime, because the party didn't want you to have your own thoughts. You were allowed only to embrace the party line. Political correctness in Oceania was not a choice, it was a requirement. The second offense was putting his ideas in a semi-permanent form, where it could be used against him. He deluded himself a bit, thinking that he might reach out to some future and hopefully freer person who might come into possession of Winston's words. But he also knew that this was nearly impossible to happen. He philosophized, and I quote, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. End quote. If you can freely state facts with no fear of retribution, you are truly free. But if you have to curb your tongue and hold back facts because they are not in line with the official narrative, you are not free. However, this is not a switch that is either on or off. There is a range of freedom that goes from fully free to completely oppressed. You might be able to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4 with no fear of retribution. But there are other things you must not say, or you will feel the boot upon your neck. I have watched a number of politicians in their own careers because they let their true thoughts slip out, which were not politically correct. People are fired from jobs for expressing ideas, even though perfectly aligned with reality. However, they are not allowed to be expressed. We see this going on around us, but how do we react? We simply use the party concept of doublethink, where you know one thing to be true, but, at the same time, know that it is false. It is a violation of the logical law of non-contradiction, because if A is true, then not A cannot be simultaneously true. So, using doublethink, you can know that a man is a true hero and near saint, while at the same time you know that he was in fact a vile degenerate who should be loathed. You can celebrate, along with the herd, something that another part of you knows will destroy you. Doublethink is a form of self-defense which can keep you out of the crosshairs of the thought police, while not yet fully giving up your agency to have some of your own thoughts that actually align with reality. Winston Smith asserted that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but later, when he was in the hands of the Ministry of Love, he was tortured into believing that 2 plus 2 equals 5, or that it could be any number that the party said it was. Reality did not exist independently from the party. Not only history, but reality itself was determined by the party. The party didn't want anyone to think for himself. Collecting your own observations was not only discouraged, it was forbidden. If you express a fact that is not in line with the party narrative, you will find not only the weight of the state upon your neck, 
but also all the true believers of the party narrative will attack you unmercifully. Something else from 1984 that is applicable today is the war on language that Big Brother was waging, as the government fleshed out the official language of Newspeak. Orwell invested a lot of time and effort in writing his appendix to the book, dedicated to some of the details of Newspeak. He wrote, and I quote, The purpose of Newspeak was not only to provide a medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits proper to the devotees of Ingsoc, but to make all other modes of thought impossible, unquote. Ingsoc was the official name for the Marxist philosophy that was the foundation of Oceania. Orwell, in fact, based the character of Big Brother, the man whose face was on posters everywhere around Winston Smith, on the man Joseph Stalin. And much, though not all, of the method used by Big Brother were based on the tactics of Soviet communism. Newspeak creation consisted of removing words unmercifully and placing them into the category of unwords, much like the category of vaporized people being unpersons. In our own society, we see words banned from common usage as well. It has been common to have words dropped and then replaced by the first letter, showing disgust while hinting at the words, but left to the listener to understand. One day, no one will understand. These unwords, once removed from newspeak, were forbidden to be used. Another thing that was striven for was the shortening of words and removing shades of meaning. There was no need for hot, warm, cool, and cold. These could all be replaced by the single word cold, and then modifying that with accepted prefixes. To say something was really hot, it would be referred to as being double plus uncold. To say something was really cold, you would say it was double plus cold. Good and bad or any dichotomy word pairs were replaced by a single word and its modifiers as desired. If something were reprehensibly despicable, it would be double plus ungood. If it were completely perfect and delightful, it would be double plus good. This, of course, would also eliminate words like perfect and delightful, for if something is double plus good, that is all a party member needed to know. And newspeak words were rigidly defined as well, so that distortion of meanings would be disallowed. Big Brother was defined as being good, so to say that he was ungood would be a contradiction in terms. It would appear to be gibberish to a user of newspeak. Words like dignity and liberty would not only be forbidden unwords, but they also would be called thought crime. Orwell gave an insightful example of this. He first quoted the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed, that, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government. Orwell then went on to write, and I quote, It would have been quite impossible to render this into newspeak while keeping to the sense of the original. The nearest one could come to doing so would be to swallow the whole package up in the single word crime think, unquote. If you try and reason with the equivalent of a party member today, you find that they use pejorative terms that work the same way to shut you up. It is effectively the same as asking you, what? You support X? Do you support crime think? End of discussion. There is no way to express shades of meaning or to sharpen an understanding of your point, for the words don't exist to the party member. All you will get back is an increased level of anger and hostility the more you try to make your point. Another new speak word that is applicable today is the term duck speak. The party openly admitted that orthodoxy was all that was required, or tolerated for that matter, and duck speak showed this exactly. What was sought by the party was blind adherence to the party line, with no thought required. Duck speak meant to quack like a duck, stating the party line with no true intelligence required or new information conveyed. If you excite a duck, it quacks, and if you stir up a true believer, he delivers duck speak orthodox party drivel until you shut up. The entire point of Newspeak was to remove even the possibility of thinking thoughts that were not aligned with orthodoxy. 
for there would be no words that could describe such ideas. For the INTJ, a newspeak word that would be particularly abhorrent was own life. This term condemned the INTJ approach to things. Own life made spending your own time on things that you personally cared about, independent of any party control, to be unacceptable. Embracing individualism or walking your own path was described as being evil or ungood. Winston's path to destruction, for a brief time, led him through a very happy period, where he fell in love with a girl named Julia, and they shared intimacy and a few other forbidden delights, consisting in part of food and time that felt truly free. Julia was not a philosopher and had little time for the details of what was wrong with society. She just knew it was ridiculous, and she was going to do what she wanted. She was a free spirit condemned to live out her life in a dark cage. Winston rented a room from a parole shopkeeper and spent time alone with Julia that was truly delightful. But ignoring his natural instinct to trust no one, in the end led to his destruction. Two people he was counting on, the parole shopkeeper and an inner party official named O'Brien, turned out to be fully dedicated followers of Big Brother. The shopkeeper, it turned out, was not the old man that he had appeared to be, but was, in fact, a man in his 30s who was a member of the Thought Police. He unleashed the police onto Winston and Julia, and they were hauled off separately to the Ministry of Love. This end was inevitable. The state had such far-reaching power and the ability to keep its citizens under constant surveillance that no one could go far in choosing a forbidden path before the state pulled him back into line. The intelligent ones, like Winston Smith, were under constant watch. Even the room that he had rented, thinking it was private, had a hidden telescreen that monitored the couple the entire time. Winston was never alone, never free from scrutiny, even when he thought he was. The uneducated masses were allowed to roam free, but the ones in the outer party, like Winston and Julia, were never free for a second. The inner party, where all of the power resided, was filled with people who were 100% on board with the system, and they were rewarded with pleasures, food, and drink, and freedom that others could only dream about. They were highly motivated to keep things running smoothly, and they were given the tools to do so. Something that few people today could properly appreciate is this statement from Orwell in Part 2, Chapter 9, and I quote, The essential act of the party is to use conscious deception while retaining the firmness of purpose that goes with complete honesty, unquote. This is key to the entire system. By claiming to be honest and to possess the high moral ground, while fearlessly proclaiming the official party points as if they were pure truth, a member of the party consciously knows that what is being conveyed is utter rubbish. Honest people who think in terms of right and wrong, valid and invalid, true and false, are defenseless against such tactics. You can't reason with a party member, for reason is of no concern to him. You can't prove such a one to be wrong, because proof requires facts, honest application of logic and reason, and further, the acceptance of the validity of these things by the other person. You are talking to a recording, a machine that regurgitates the party line, with no love for reality. In fact, such a one doesn't even believe in reality, only the party line. When Winston was being tortured and mentally conditioned by O'Brien in the Ministry of Love, the torturer said, We control matter because we control the mind. Reality is inside the skull. This statement is valid only in the perception of the one who is being controlled, but it is not valid in the great scheme of things. Reality is independent of observation. If there were no one alive to be an observer, reality would still exist. However, to an individual... What is accepted as reality, of course, goes on inside the skull. By changing the perceptions of a man, that man can have his understanding of reality changed in any direction that the party desires. It is only by cutting ties with the party control and studying the world for yourself that you can begin to perceive reality for yourself. In Oceania, there was no way to break free from the television screen. Winston had visited O'Brien earlier in the story and he saw a bit of how the inner party lived. Smith was amazed when O'Brien got up and turned off his video screen. This was unheard of outside of the inner party. Winston's amazement showed just how tight the bonds were that held him inside an orthodox life. There was literally no way out. 
At the end of the book, after Winston Smith's mind had been properly broken, the story closed with this statement about Winston Smith. I quote, But it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. Unquote. This reminds me of the closing lines of the humorous, though too often correct, National Lampoon's Deteriorata. With all its hopes, dreams, promises, and urban renewal, the world continues to deteriorate. Give up. Have you read 1984? What do you think of it? Other books that show a slightly different expression of these topics are Animal Farm, also by George Orwell, and Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Please share your comments on any or all of these books. If you enjoyed the video, please click like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you click on the bell, you will also receive notification when I put up a new video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.